Polaroid's instant photo printer for smartphones, and more, coming up on today's episode of Malays and Tech News. Hey Gadgeteer, you're just in time for the latest episode of the world's only 3-in-1 show on tech, gadgets, and gaming news. That's right, this is Malays and Tech News. My name is Taylor Merrick, and if you're new here, hit that subscribe button right now so that you don't miss out on the latest. We do this on a daily around here, and... On the off chance that we're not able to get a show out to you and you're wondering, well, do you get a show out? Yeah, well, we can get a show out to you if you're subscribed and uh, you're, you're you're notified because uh, that's usually how the subscription thing works. I probably shouldn't explain it because I'm probably confusing myself in the process. Um, speaking of confusing, we'll be taking a look at, uh, for our feature story, Polaroid's new smartphone photo printer for 2019. If you're wondering why this looks eerily similar to the one they came out with in um, 2012 well <laughs> I got a secret to share with you but just wait till we get to the future sorry we'll also be taking a look at 5g uses less power than 4g at peak bit rates but it uses more power for basic tasks interesting news coming to light there in that arena and we'll also be taking a look at uh, why an in-game backpack apparently has World of Warcraft fans fuming Control explains the fate of Alan Wake and uh, more. And finally, we'll be taking a look at Fortnite is letting players vote on rotating store skins. And you might be like, well, where are the other stories? This is all I was able to find today. I mean, apparently nothing else interesting is going on news-wise outside of the Apple September announcement event that happened like yesterday. The day before, something like that. I'm confused already. It's been so many days. Uh, hence that apparently this is still still in the news cycle, still in the news media. So everybody's all talking about that. Now, we already covered it. See, if you were tuned into the show and you listened to yesterday's show and you're, and you're a regular listener, you know what I'm talking about. We already covered uh, the news, so we don't need to rehash old news because uh, there's really nothing new to be uncovered, right? Well, speaking of uh, nothing new, well, before we can, let's take a look back on today in tech history. All right, today is September 11th, 2019. On this day in 1985, the International Cometary Explorer passes through the gas tail of comet P. Giacobini Zinner. They have weird comet names. The first ever man-made object to pass through the tail of a comet, and I guarantee probably Guinness Book World Record there. Unbelievable. I mean, I survived. I collected data. It was cool. It was fun. But we haven't heard anything since. Like, land that sucker. It's 2019. Land that sucker on the comet. You know, do the, 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 the harvesting and, and then, you know, detach and then return back to Earth. That'd be cool. It'd be fun. It's 2019. For crying out loud. Anyways, I'm probably getting ahead of myself and turning into sci-fi mode on this day in history in 19... 19- 40, the first public remote computerization was demonstrated. The first public demonstration of remote computation occurs during a meeting of the American Mathematical Society at Dartmouth College Bell Laboratories. Sorry, I gotta say it when I see it. Researcher George Stibitz set up a terminal that allowed conference attendees to perform remote calculations over telephone lines with Bell Lab's complex number calculator located in New York City. Stiblitz had first tested a connection on September 9th, an event memorialized by a plaque in front of the McNutt Hall at Dartmouth College, and it turned out it went great. Telegraph terminal? Um, good thing we don't use those anymore. That would have taken far, far too long for us to uh, communicate via typewriter. Right? Am I right? With that out of the way, let's head on over to today's feature story. Oh, you guys are going to love this one, or you're going to hate it, one of the two. It's not, my, it's not my fault. It's just what came up on the news. Apparently, everybody's still going googly-eyed over Apple's announcements and all the new tech that came out of it. We already covered it on a show yesterday and, uh, and uh, speculated on rumors, uh, many shows hence prior to that. So, no need to beat a dead horse if indeed it is dead. But uh, with that in mind, if you're interested in articles that uh, we happen to cover on today's show... All you got to do is head on over to technewsgadget.net. We'll be taking a look at, well, Polaroid's new smartphone photo printer is the worst tech product of 2019 
and 2012. <laughs> this comes to us from Android Police, and uh, it says, you know how a traditional photo lab works, right? You go into a red room with your film negatives and treat them with a developer, stopper, fixer, and clearing solutions until you get a visible, accurate result. Well, what if you want to develop and print a photo taken with your phone? Well, it's simple. Buy Polaroid's 130 buck optical scanner printer called the Polaroid Lab. Uh, that's right, this baby uses a bunch of lights and mirrors to bring an image on your phone's screen down to a box full of chemicals on top of Polaroid Instant Film. Now, if you love the aesthetic, it's, it, it's really not it's all it's for um, having the aesthetic of a Polaroid Instant Photo taking up wall space on your dorm room or bedroom or, or a bulky physical album or collage or whatever you wanted to do with it. This will do it for you because... But, Let's be honest, it's 2019, we're probably a little bit beyond that, but, you know, scrapbooking nostalgia purposes is still uh, in, in, in existence. But if that weren't enough for you, you can grab those photos and bring them back into your phone with a stunning augmented reality app called Polaroid Originals. It's said to work with iOS 11 and Android 7 Nugget devices from Samsung, Huawei, Google, and OnePlus. Now... If you're interested, the Polaroid Lab is expected to ship in October and will also be available in Europe for 130 euros and in the UK for 119 pounds. And they do have a page on it. Uh, yeah, it looks like PolaroidOriginals.com. But uh, yeah, speaking of Polaroid Originals, you might be curious to know that this isn't some evolution of the original Massachusetts-based company that declared bankruptcy in 2001, nor the reformed Polaroid entity that went bust in 2008. Um, although, who knows if we were keeping tabs on this stuff back then, but the Dutch firm that picked up its brand identity and intellectual property in 2017. Prior to that, the company which has made the Polaroid Lab was known as the Impossible Project. Now, the Impossible Project was founded just after Polaroid announced its second bankruptcy and signaled the end of production for its film. In the following years, the project made its own film for use in Polaroid cameras, as well as apps and other products, some of which made their ways to crowdfunding campaigns. One of them was Instant Lab. And uh, we got a little bit of a demonstration going on here of exactly how it works. In case you're wondering, why does this look familiar? Yep, these are the people that kickstarted a photo $189 scanner printer roughly seven years ago in an attempt to perhaps save the Polaroid brands. Uh, and they're the same ones that brought the rights to plaster uh, that said Polaroid brand on said scanner printer and sell it with a couple of tweaks for $59 less in 2019. Um, <laughs> I like how they uh, wrap up this article. Add on a twice-defeated corporate legacy of, well, you know who, and this whole thing could pass as an episode of The Walking Dead. What a world, what a roid. And they got photos with it, but uh, yeah, gosh. I mean, who who does the instant photo things anymore? You have a smartphone for crying out loud. If you want to see it, it's right there on your phone. You don't need to get it developed. It's the main reason why the instant photo thing was cool because you could take a picture and see it instantly. I, I was doing air quotes. If you're listening to the podcast, you totally missed it. Um, yeah, instant. Give it a couple of minutes. That you know, I had to print it on film and, and and spit it out and everything, which was impressive, definitely at that time. Um, but you you have to keep this in mind. Yeah, you, you got to keep innovating, guys. And from a business standpoint and consumer standpoint, you always have to be innovating because uh, people will get bored of the stale old, same old, same old. So keep innovating. Uh, but they didn't. And smartphones came along. And then there's this great idea. You take a photo with your smartphone, you could see it instantly. Ooh, and further, you could share it with your friends and family and whoever else wanted to see it on photo instantly and by instantly i mean you tap the button instant mere milliseconds passed between the sending of you know your phone to wherever it was going and then came the advent of being able to post it on social networks wow instant and then came instagram and ruined everything for everybody no okay <laughs> and then uh you have the option of walgreens and, and walmarts of the world at least here in the united states and other photo printing places where you could just send your photos if you want to get them printed up and they took the photos right there online in app whatever printed them off said hey you're ready to pick up and off you went 
so yeah, I don't really understand the attempt here. I guess, I guess this is a throwback at nostalgia's sake, but uh, yeah. Um, well, I guess if you're interested, you got the links here. Um, to go ahead and learn more or or, or purchase or everything. Um, what do you guys think? Are you are you excited? As you can tell, I'm uh not really excited, but uh, yeah, this kind of kind of explains the case in point for why the title was titled the way it was. Um, the worst tech product of 2019. Although, if you find any tech products of 2019 that are worse than this gadget, uh, be sure to let me know down in the comments. That'd be greatly appreciated. All right, moving on to some more tech news. Apparently, 5G uses less power than 4G at peak bit rates, but it's using more for basic tasks. Now, if you've been holding off on buying a 5G device because you're concerned about cellular power drain, don't fret. 5G devices are actually capable of delivering greater energy efficiency than 4G LTE models, according to a new study by the Signals Research Group, though either 5G or 4G may consume less power depending on the bit rates and applications being used at any given moment. SRG's test in Minneapolis, Minnesota, used Verizon's 5G and 4G networks with the Samsung Galaxy S10 5G, specifically the US model containing the Qualcomm Snapdragon 855 and X50 modem components, used in other early 5G devices. Armed with test equipment from a Coover and Spirant, SRG ran battery tests at 5 megabytes per second, 30 megabytes per second, and maximum possible bit rates, switching between two 5G radio conditions and multiple 4G conditions, including two and three carrier aggregation. Now, the results are mixed, but generally positive for 5G devices. At maximum possible bit rates, which on Verizon's millimeter wave 5G network can be in a 1 gigabytes per second range, 5G could be meaningfully more energy efficient than LTE. That continued to be true for relatively modest 5G speeds compared with much faster LTE than is generally found in the US, but the tables turned when network was constrained to lower bit rates where 4G was more energy efficient than 5G, presumably since 5G uses more power when it's on and needs to stay on longer to transmit the same amount of data. It's kind of interesting. In other words, early 5G chips are able to blast huge amount of data, say a really large file, with much greater power efficiency than a typical 4G, but suffer when they're forced to dribble data, say a typical web page with tons of small files out at 4G-like speeds. Now, since early 5G devices can simultaneously connect to 4G and 5G, there's probably some software optimizations should be coming along the way uh, to enable them to make better choices about where to transmit their data. So, yeah, it's um, definitely interesting. But yeah, who would have thought? I mean, I was always wondering, I was like, Oh, I wonder if there's going to be a hang-up with 5G. Well, this is one of them. Um, so if you're wondering, well, I need to rush out the phone and buy the 5G right now. Nope. Don't do it. The phone that you have currently, and, and, and if you have to go out and get a phone this year, 4G, LTE, or whatever latest phones before the latest, latest phones are going to work just fine. Yeah, give it a year or two, I'm um, thinking here, for 5G, just because it's still a little bit in the early stages. Um, overall, in general, obviously, um, that's why kind of a lot of carriers aren't exactly ready and equipped for it. And the same could be said for the smartphone makers. But uh, there's stuff in technology and things that need to be sorted out in the back and that us consumers have absolutely no idea about. Um, such as what we're talking about right now. <laughs> so just keep in mind, it's going to be there. It might just take a little bit to catch up, but once it does catch up, you'll be uh, benefiting from much faster upload and download speeds worldwide in general. All right, on to some gaming news. Why this article? Why an in-game backpack has World of Warcraft fans fuming? Oh, for crying out loud. If you are really interested in, in uh, seeing this story and, and seeing my reaction to it as I uh, unpack this story for you, head on over to youtube.com forward slash tech news gadget. But apparently a bunch of people are upset. Uh, in World of Warcraft, one of the biggest sources of content is acquiring new gear for your character. Players can complete new content, search the world, run old raids and craft gear, then spend hours in a transmorgification system to make sure that their hero looks as cool as possible. For many players, this means that sets like endgame raid gear are highly treasured. 
Which kind of is begging the question, why are fans upset over the addition of an in-game backpack? Well, <laughs> this backpack, you see, is one of the rewards for the overhauled Recruit a Friend system. If players get their friends to play World of Warcraft and pay for a subscription, the player will earn exclusive rewards that include the aforementioned backpack, a plane mount, a two-seated camel mount, and other Desert Explorer-themed rewards. For the most part, this isn't surprising and mirrored rewards similar from past Recruit a Friend initiatives, but one item in particular has caused a significant amount of controversy, however, and that's this stinking backpack. Um, see? Right here. Right here on the screen? Right here? That backpack? That one. Yeah, that one right there. Mm-hmm. World of Warcraft fans have wanted more character customization for years now. It's kind of been, uh, you know, beating a dead horse. Uh, the game struggles to give players as much creative freedom as competitors like Final Fantasy XIV. While there are countless ways to look like an epic hero or scheming villain, many players want more humble ways to express their individuality. More scars, the ability to wear glasses, more hairstyles, and of course, non-cape back items like backpacks. More customization options. One of the most popular changes in Battle for Azeroth was the ability for players to hide pieces of gear so that they could show off tattoos or a more streamlined look. People take character customization very seriously, and if you're like, not really into that, but I guess more power to you, it's probably as far as you're going to go for understanding this, but if you're a hardcore World of Warcraft player, well, this either is definitely something that, uh, you know, is right up there with uh, a guy having to redo the raids so that you're not boring when you're power leveling people up through them. I'm talking about your alts, not your friends. Um, you know, people uh, just want a way to get a much requested piece of gear, uh, but they're kind of frustrated that they have to recruit their friends now. Of course, fans have already realized that there's a way they, they can game the system by setting up new accounts and spending in-game gold or real money on game time. They can follow the new rewards over to their main account. However, this has a really very real cost. Um, nearly 2 million gold worth of tokens or in a neighborhood of 200 bucks. So, all oh, oh, stupid backpack. Something that adds to the frustration is that there's already a profession that could find desert-themed cosmetics. Archaeology. Players are frustrated that despite a plausible in-game way to earn these rewards, they remain exclusive to, I guess, it being a paid-only item. Um, or, in this case, recruit a friend. It's not clear whether the backpack will remain alluringly behind the recruit a friend wall, or whether more non-cape back cosmetics will come to World of Warcraft in the future. For now, the fewer highlights a very real player concern. In a game like World of Warcraft, players should be able to express who they are through customization. Oh, it's just a stinking backpack, guys, for crying out loud. If you're going to... You sound as bad as the kids whining about Fortnite. Oh, they took out the sword. Oh, they need to put the sword back in. Oh, my God, the sword's OP. Uh, uh, the mechs are OP now. Um, the new gun that you guys brought back is OP. Uh, the vaulted item that you re-unvaulted is, is OP. Oh, why'd you have to bring the pack to pistol? That was so bad. Oh, I hate that skin. Oh, for crying out loud. Here's my piece of advice to it. Play the stinking game. Quit whining about it. Um, or go find something else to do. Great suggestion in case in point. Go outside for a walk. You're, you're, you're too white. Okay. Eat a salad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just made two movie references there in like the same sentence. Uh, if you can guess which movies I just quoted, let me know down in the comments section on YouTube or on Twitter. We are at Tech News Gadget. And if you're wondering why I didn't want to continue on, it's because there's nothing more I needed to say about it. Otherwise, I would have started digging myself a hole, and then you guys would have been like, what he said, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, uh, anyways, Control uh, finally went to explain the fate of Alan Wake. Now, for those of you wondering, at least those of you who weren't caught up in the uh, hype that was Control, this new video game uh, that had has just come out uh, not too long ago. It's more of a horror genre style game so expect to get scared uh for those of you following along or at least familiar with alan wake he's kind of has um following in in this game genre but uh remedy entertainment's control is perhaps the 
the weirdest of the studio games so far, imagining a universe in which alternate dimensions intrude on our own, paranormal objects with weird powers are the norm, and a building with shifting rooms is an everyday workplace annoyance. It also does some work to link all past Remedy games together in one form or another, but none so much as Remedy's well-loved but sadly languishing supernatural horror story, Alan Wake. As it turns out, Control is filled with Alan Wake callbacks, but they go beyond just giving Remedy fans some Easter eggs. They also give clues as to what happened in that story since the release of the original game. They also recontextualize a lot of the events in Alan Wake, while also giving some clues as to how Alan's story might get continued in Control. Now, after Remedy released an in image teasing post-release control expansion, all of which but confirms an Alan Wake, ti Alan Wake tie in, mind you, it seems like bridging the two franchises even more is the studio's plan. Here's a rundown of every bit of Alan Wake's related info that's hidden in control and what it might mean to the future of Remedy Games. Uh, now, we won't actually be covering all of them, we'll just be covering a couple here, so kind of like wet your whistle, and then if you get interested, you're like, Oh, I haven't played Alan Wake in a while. Maybe I should replay it. Well, yeah, go ahead and replay it. You'll find out the story um, and maybe something that you missed about it. Or you can hop in Control and then go, Oh, I remember that. Oh, I remember that. Oh, Easter egg. So, first off, Alan Wake's story was an altered world event. Hmm, the Federal Bureau of Control specializes in investigating, containing, and covering up the existence of altered world events, or AWEs. Why does this remind me of Men in Black? I don't know. These are basically moments when other dimensions creep into our own with varying supernatural results. The document Bright Falls AWE found in Control show that the Bureau responded to the events of Alan Wake but arrived after the events of the game. During Alan Wake, Sheriff Sarah Breaker tells Wayne's literary agent Barry Wheeler to make some calls and give the code phrase Night Springs. Apparently, that was Sarah's way of notifying people close to the Bureau of what was happening, especially her father, Frank, who Control reveals to be a retired FBC agent. According to the FBC Cauldron Lake, where the dark place resides in Alan Wake and the place from which Alan's power to rewrite reality comes in from, is a threshold. These are locations where dimensions bleed together, and we see a few in control. The documents say that the FBC has investigated Cauldron Lake more than once in the 1970s and the years mentioned seem to line up with the other events. In Alan Wake, poet Thomas Zane discovered the Dark Presence, the game's antagonist, in the 1970s and wrote the story that would lay the groundwork for Alan's arrival in Bright Falls. More on Zane later. The Bureau also notes that Alan's power to rewrite reality was isolated to Bright Falls and limited in how long it lasted. But given the events of Alan Wake and the far-reaching effects of Zane and Alan's writing, especially with Alan showing up elsewhere in Alan Wake's American Nightmare, it seems like the Bureau doesn't understand quite how big a deal Bright Falls Threshold actually is. In the meantime, the Bureau left a monitoring station in Bright Falls to watch for additional AWE activity. That might be the group that Barry notifies with the Night Springs code word, the list Sheriff Breaker gives him to call includes a number of people in the town. Hmm. Oh, and then there's also this little Easter egg. Alan, I guess, was a prime candidate for FBC director. You see, the FBC has quite a bit of information on Alan as a person, tracking his movement and capabilities, specifically his ability to shape reality through his writing. The Bureau never found Alan. However, we know from the events of Alan Wake that he gave himself to the dark place in exchange for his wife, Alice. The Bureau seems to think that Alan is a person with paranatural abilities, someone who can control objects of power and altered items. According to the other documents, they have on file his potential as a prime candidate for a new director, just like Jesse and Dylan Faden. Interesting. While I'm not going to really go into uh, the Easter eggs that much more, if you are interested in wanting to read about the rest of it and you're into the whole sci-fi supernatural genre horror story alan wake and, and, and control i'll leave that for you to go ahead and and research into the link to this article will be over at technewsgadget.net and finally fortnite is letting players vote on rotating store skins and uh, also in case you're wondering greasy grove and moisty meyer are also back in part um, with all the trouble surrounding Brute and Turbo building changes, players have often felt their voices aren't being heard. Well, they are just...
quit whining. Jeez, Epic Games has gone some way to reverse some of the issues by introducing updates to bring more balance to the game, but its latest update, 10.3, could do more to repair relations with the community by giving them more choice over what items come to its store. As part of the multi-platform update, Epic has introduced a new feature called Community Choice. It gives players the power to vote for what comes back to a new item shop slot. The company says it'll provide a choice of content, namely skins, that players can vote once a day for to return. Now, because Epic offers Fortnite Battle Royale mode as a free download, that company obviously recoups its production costs via virtual items in its in-game store. Duh. <laughs> in case you're new to how gaming works in 2019, here's your awakening. Um, welcome. We wear shirts here. <laughs> what movie is that from? Uh... I'm watching too many too much pop culture. I gotta stop. Skins, emotes, and weapon wraps form the bulk of the game's revenue, but some items only appear in the store for 24 hours before disappearing for an unknown and very wildly random amount of time. The idea seems to be that if you offer players a choice over what comes back to the game, that they might be more likely to buy it. Well, obviously, I think they're just figuring out the best way to implement this. That is an only big change in today's update in Fortnite, though. In keeping with Season 10's Rift Zone theme, Epic has brought back two of Fortnite's most beloved locations, at least in part, Moisty Mire and Greasy Grove. In Greasy Grove, gone is Durr Burger, in case you're wondering, replaced with a taco store that somehow facilitates the dropping of spicy tacos from the sky. Good thing this wasn't Taco Tuesday. They offer 10 health points when eaten and a 40% increase in speed, granting players rotational movement heavily lacking in Season 10. While in Greasy Zone, gamers are also encouraged to dance, making them invulnerable to damage while they regenerate health at 20 points per second. Moisty Moyer isn't back completely, though. It's been merged with Paradise Palms to create Moisty Palms. Most of the desert town remains, but beloved POIs like the Swamp and the Prison have returned. Because things just really can't be simple, the Moisty Rift Zone will also disguise players as a random prop when they crouch. Think uh, lamps, plants, or toilets here, guys. Uh, players are encouraged to hide and ambush unsuspecting opponents. So uh, don't be caught unawares in there if you do happen to wander into um, that area. Remember when players had the opportunity to choose which guns came back to Fortnite and they chose the drum gun? Well, seems like putting power in the hands of the community isn't always beneficial. But that said, if today's update covers mainly cosmetics, there'll be less for players to complain about. And if seriously find something to complain about, I don't know what's going to make you happy. Maybe going outside, running around, jumping up and down, um, dancing in the rain, something. Do something. Because, um, uh, you know, life isn't just involved playing Fortnite 24-7. Um, I'm looking at you, Ninja. No, I'm kidding. He doesn't play Fortnite 24-7. He has a set time that he plays a certain games and then a set time that he spends with his family and friends and people who matter most to him and sleeps, obviously, because that's what people do. We're not robots. Anyways, um, yeah, I think that covers it. Uh, if I missed anything, be sure to let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Tech News Gadget. And with that, that wraps up this episode of the Lace and Tech News. Thanks for tuning in. New episodes every weekday. The Lace and Tech News can be found on every major platform, including Apple, Spotify, Google, YouTube, Stitcher, Overcast, and more. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, let us know by clicking that like button and by leaving a comment. If you're watching a YouTube video and if you're listening via podcast, head on over to the Apple Podcast Store and leave a review or leave a review in the app you're currently listening in. And be sure to double check that you're subscribed so that you don't miss the next episode. And as always, be sure to share this with a friend. I'm your host, Taylor Merrick, and remember, for the latest in tech, gadget, and gaming news, visit technewsgadget.net. Pretty much, keep being awesome, guys, and I'll see you on the flip side.